have with us that we have our schedule. Are we pulling out two different ones? Yeah, you're pulling out that one and the one that's titled Supervision of Holders of Technologists for Oscopy Permits. So you're pulling both of those out. The first one we're going to talk about is the state of California. <laughs> So this is a this is a document that you should guard with your life, tuck it away someplace. What this document is is uh, basically seven pages of interpretations of the fluoro laws that I just read you for the state of California. And this is where it gets sticky. So let's just go directly to page three. These are practical examples. So they've already gone through and said that you know, licentiate needs to have its permit. If the actuator energized, blah, 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 CRT can take x-rays on humans only with acting in their scope of certificate, blah, 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 blah. So it's just a repeat of what I just said. Now they're going to give you practical examples of how they interpret some things. So for example one, a CRT with a fluoroscopic permit operates the mobile fluoroscope in surgery. The CRTF is working with a surgeon. The surgeon does not operate the fluoroscopic equipment. Does the surgeon have to have the supervisor and operator S and O? The answer is yes. yes. It doesn't matter if that physician touches the equipment or not. The physician is telling you what to do, which means they're supervising. It's illegal. Now, if you, and that's considered, since they're telling you what to do, they're directly controlling fluoro, so they're violating the law. Now, here's your ethical conundrum. What do you do? You've been called up to help in a procedure and, act, and use fluoroscopic C-arm on this patient. Patient's asleep, probably open at this point, under general anesthetic, and you look on your list, Every C-arm in your facilities just about have a list that says who the certified supervisor and operators are. You look on your list, that doctor's not there. What do you do? No. We do not walk away from a patient that's, a, especially when the patient's under anesthetic and open. No. What you do is you make a note to yourself, time, date, place, circumstance, what the patient is, what exam you've been called to do, and who the physician is. You do the procedure, because you've got a patient, patient life at stake. State of California allows that as an emergency, provided it's completely documented. So you keep track of that when the procedure is done. The first place you go is downstairs, you find your either department manager, you find your supervisor, you find the chief of radiology, you say, excuse me, I just went up, I did perform fluoro at the direction of Dr. So-and-so who does not have a permit, but the patient was under anesthesia and was open. After that, somebody else takes care of it. Okay. So you do have without feeling like you're going to get arrested or thrown in jail or fined, a one time, for that physician, one time because the patient was at risk and it's considered emergent. Okay? And as long as you report it and make sure it's reported, somebody does a physical, a written report that you can sign and, and state this is what occurred on this date and time and all that, then there are usually things going on in the hospital. There's committees that look at this and determine what to do. Usually the chief of service will go to that physician and say, what are you doing ordering fluoro and making a, a technologist do fluoro and you don't have a permit? I have seen physicians, at least in our organization I work for, physicians that were banned. They couldn't do surgery. 
because they didn't have a permit. And they would say, well, I'll, I'll just bring in, you know, Dr. Jones, he has a per permit as long as he's in the room, and we'll get to that. That's another example. Okay, example two on page four. A licentiate with the fluoroscopic SNO permit is actuating the x-ray on switch and the accompanying CRT is assisting by positioning the patient, adjusting exposure factors, or positioning the fluoroscopic equipment after the initial exposure has been made. This is done when the x-ray is both on and off. Does the CRT have to have a fluoroscopic permit? Yes, that's the purpose of the whole thing. Okay, whether the equipment's on or off, if you're manipulating any of those things, you need to have a permit. Okay. Uh, example three, CRT sets up the fluoroscopy room for the radiologist who performs the fluoroscopic procedures. The radiologist has the radiology supervisor and operator certificate. The setup work by the technologist includes placing the patient on the table, pulling the fluoroscopy image intensifier over the patient, locking it into position, adjusting control panel from radiographic to fluoroscopic mode. Radiologist reviews the setup and makes adjustments at his or her discretion prior to initiating fluoroscopic exposures. Technologist administers bearing sulfate and changes spot films during the examination as the radiologist adjusts the patient's position, repositions the II as needed, makes adjustments to the fluoroscopic field and exposure factors. After the fluoroscopic examination is over, the technologist performs the quote overhead unquote radiographic film. Must the CRT have the fluoroscopic permit? No. The radiologist's acceptance or modification of the subsequent of the position or technical factors confirms their acceptability prior to initiating the exposure, and they're running it. So you're fine. Example four: What tasks can healthcare workers such as nurses and medical assistants perform to assist the licentiate who possesses? the appropriate certificate or permit. The workers do not possess a CRT fluoro permit. Examples, placing the patient on the table, moving a mobile fluoroscope from storage to the examination room, moving the equipment over the patient, plugging in and turning on the power. Prior to the initiation of the fluoroscopic exposure, the licentiate is responsible for reviewing the setup and making any necessary adjustments. The licentiate is responsible for these actions, whether or not they actually perform them. Answer. In these three situations, the position of the patient, the equipment, and the technical factors have been finalized and accepted by the licentiate prior to the initiation of the fluoroscopic examination. Once the fluoroscopic examination has begun with the initiating exposure, the nurse or medical assistant may not perform tasks associated with the exposure of the patient. So this is where the state says, we're going to define the procedure starting when somebody steps on that pedal the first time. <coughs> Up to that point, they can help move things around. Physician has to review it and find it acceptable. If the state comes in and finds that some other person is doing that, but the physician is not verifying, validating, and making sure that what's been done is correct, then there's a problem with the physician, not with you. Example five. CRT with a fluoroscopic permit performs fluoroscopy under standing orders from a radiology supervisor and operator using the fluoroscopic equipment. There is no radiologist in the room. Can the CRT perform fluoroscopy? The answer is yes. Now, let's protect ourselves a little bit. That means you are not operating fluoro independently. You need to have a script, not just a protocol that says you will do this and this and this and this, but a script, step by step, and you follow that script. Now, where this is a big deal is with, um, um, what do they call it? Um, speech therapists who think that speech therapists, they have a master's degree, very bright, very well trained, very important. But when they're evaluating a person, they walk into a room and they suddenly feel that you work for them. And it's like, no, 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 it doesn't work like that. Their responsibility ends with mixing what it is they want the patient to swallow, having the patient put it in their mouth, okay, 
at that point, you have a protocol, and you determine, that protocol, I should say, determines what you do, how long you fluoro, what film or projection you take, it's all in that procedure. And it has to be done step by step by step. Oftentimes you get professionals who say, no, 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 we're gonna do it this way. No, we're not doing it that way. If you wanna do it that way, then you need to go talk to the chief of radiology and get this changed. Or we have to bring a physician in the room. So if they don't like the protocol as it's written, they wanna do something else, you have to have a physician to protect yourself. Otherwise, you're performing fluoro at the direction of someone who's what? Not a supervisor and operator. Okay. Um, example six, CRT with a fluoro permit, working under the general supervision of radiology supervisor and operator. Fluoroscopes and videotapes of patients swallowing contrast media. Procedures performed using a mobile unit. Radiologist views the videotape and makes the interpretation. Can the technologist operate the fluoroscope and videotape the fluoroscopic image? And the answer is yes. Again, you're work doing that under a protocol, and actually the live fluoro you're doing is being videotaped. So it's covered. Okay. <coughs> So in examples five and six, the technologist is working under the supervision of a radiologist under policy and procedures of the department. So um, you abide by the radiology department policy and procedure for determining appropriateness and administration. So, but the SNO radiology certificate has the responsibility for the appropriateness of the administration of x-ray by the CRT. So, this has to be covered in writing and be very specific. Okay. So when you read these protocols, you have to feel confident and safe that number one, that's what you're gonna do, that the protocol's complete. Physicians will sometimes write a protocol and you'll read it and go, uh, there's a step missing here. Something has to happen between, I don't know, step five and step six and it's not here, what do I do? They'll might ask you for an example and say, well, I should be doing this or somebody should be doing this and they need to change it. So don't be shy about offering commentary about a protocol if you think something's missing. Okay. Example seven is a CRT with therapy, a, th a therapy tech required to possess a fluoroscopic permit to operate a therapy simulator, which is a fluoro machine. The answer is no. There is no requirement for a therapy technologist to have a permit to operate a fluoroscopic simulator, okay? um, provided there's procedures and, and stuff involved, but they don't, they don't need one. They are not allowed to use that equipment for any diagnostic purpose. Okay. As long as it's being used to set up a patient for therapy, which is unlikely anymore, most places now are using CT, <coughs> But uh, up until only probably five years ago, therapy simulators were still being used. Okay. Oh, example eight, cardiac catheterization lab setting, cardiologist possesses a fluoro supervisor and operator certificate. Cardiovascular technologist assists the cardiologist by positioning the patient and moving the tube at the direction of the cardiologist, but only when the tube is not generating x-rays. The cardiovascular technologist performing fluoroscopy. The answer is yes. Car the CVT is performing tasks during the fluoroscopy examination pursuant to CCR Title 17, Section 30450 that are reserved for individuals possessing radiologic technology fluoroscopy <clears throat> permit. This is the big fight going on in Sacramento. How it's gonna be resolved, I don't know. But the, CV the National CVT Association is really pushing to say we don't need a CRT in the room because they can't do anything else. I personally am very insulted about that, and I, I made a public statement to that effect. Um, every person in this room, when you have a fluoro permit, is capable of doing anything and everything that a CVT tech can do. Okay. They don't do anything special, as far as I'm concerned. There are some nursing functions that they do, 
other things like that. But I know what CRTs can do because 45 years ago I did them. I made catheters, I made guide wires, I did TPRs, I drew up contrast, I administered contrast, I flushed catheters. I did everything that a lot of the nurses do today. We didn't have n nurses, so I know we're trainable to do those things. So we'll see how that works out, but as of right now, CVTs cannot do that. Okay, example nine. Uh, hospitals often provide medical services through cardiac catheterization, interventional other labs. Fluoroscopy is an integral part of these services. To minimize the staffing impact of having CRTs with floral permits available during these procedures, can cardiovascular techs, nurses, or other non radiological staff obtain permits to perform fluoroscopy? The answer is no. That's just done. No. CVT can if they go back to school. So they, get, they would have to come back here or someplace like this and go through the same protocol that you did and have dual licensure. There are people who do that. Uh, I'm duly licensed, actually triply licensed. Uh, <coughs> bless you, radiographic, fluoroscopy, and nuclear medicine. I mean, you do it, you, you do what you need to do, but as, of, as it stands right now, you can't. Now these were done back in 2008. For those of you that have never attended a meeting of the um, CRC, uh, CRC, let's see, California Radiology Technology Certification, CRC, TV, anyway, Certification Board, they meet twice a year, once in Sacramento and once down in Southern California, what's interesting, this is a committee, it's made up of physicians, school directors, CRTs, uh, and there is one physicist on there, um, they basically provide, um, what do I want? consultation and recommendations to the radiological health branch for how uh, the practice of radiology should be practiced in the state. Uh, that's what's driving. At some point, you may have two tests to continue to do, but at some point, you're only going to get one certificate. They're finally going to do what was actually suggested by a committee that I sat on 30 years ago where we said, why do we have two certificates? They're gonna teach the fluoro part in our CRT schools anyway, so the CRT should include fluoro as part of the, the exam. The state said no, they like the extra money, I guess. Um, at some point, they're gonna be combined, so you'll only get one certificate, but it'll probably cost you a little bit more. Uh, but. If you're ever available and you hear that the RTCC is meeting in Southern California and you can't attend, I strongly suggest that you attend so you can, you can see how government basically runs your career, your profession. Um, I, think it's, I think it's an important lesson to see and hopefully it'll help you get involved and be active in your career. Um, okay, next document is supervisor and holders of technologists for us to be permits. Uh, this is real quick, this is only three pages. Um, this is what the fluoro supervisor and operator is <laughs> responsible for, okay? And it's their responsibility to ascertain that CRTs under their jurisdiction are competent and comply with knowing exactly which examination you want them to, to make before they make an exposure, clear the philosophy room of all non-essential persons. There's a whole list of things here that it's their responsibility to make sure that you do. I get asked a lot, well, if I don't do it, whose fault is it? Okay, well, it's, it's law enforcement's responsibility to make sure that I drive safely on the street, but when I don't, who gets nailed? I do. So you do have to take that into account. So you should always know for the facility that you're working in what your written responsibilities are. And they are in a procedure book, protocol book, they should be written. You should be able to read them. Okay. Um, 
there's definitions, then they, they talk about direct supervision, they talk about immediate and personal supervision, and the differences between those, okay, and what you're restricted. So again, your restrictions are, you, is you cannot perform a fluoroscopic procedure without a specific order from a supervisor. Now it's funny, a lot of say, well, we don't get orders from doctors. Some referring doctor sends down an order for a GI exam. True, but that gets approved through a process in the radiology department. So it's a de facto authorization. If that order comes through to you, it's gone through a process of being evaluated according to a protocol that says, yes, we're gonna do this exam. Okay, so that takes care of that. You cannot use fluoroscopic equipment without written standing orders and repeat spot film policies and you can't make the diagnosis, we've talked about that. You cannot operate fluoroscopic equipment without having been trained to operate the particular fluoroscopic and ancillary equipment safely and effectively. Um, yes, any place you work, one of the first things you should do in your early days there is, is make time to have an experienced technologist, don't ask the doctors, an experienced technologist, usually the lead or supervisor, show you each room, because you're gonna be working with different manufacturers, different ages, okay? And you need to know more than just, you know, this you step on this, and you turn this on, and you go. No, you need to know more, you need to know what every, every bell, whistle, and button does, you need to know where your, um, you know, where all the different things are, so you know that the speaker works, the the microphone works. If you're talking to a patient in the room, you know, adjacent, and they need to to hear you, you need to know KV and MA adjustment, any kind of pre-processing, post-processing. You need a real tutorial. Most places, large places, when a new piece of equipment is installed, what they do is they have something called train the trainer. So they'll take a small group of technologists and run them through the manufacturer training for that piece of equipment, and then those technologists are expected, as part of their job, to then teach other technologists and new hires how to use that room. When you do that, make sure you ask plenty of questions and feel comfortable, because that requirement is a regulatory requirement for physicians as well, and I guarantee you, probably over 90% of the physicians have no clue how any of your portable CRs work other than this gives me fluoro, this gives me a spot film. Because that's the instruction they received from their mentor physician or some physician in the department to give them the basics. When I used to lecture surgical residents, I told them, find the most experienced technologist that works in surgery that you can find, go to a C-arm and ask them to show you how everything on that unit works, because you're responsible. And you guys need to understand, people are gonna look at you as being the expert. It's just kind of, when Joint Commission comes into a hospital, or any other group, they de facto, Joint Commission and Social Security considers that every piece of extra equipment is under the control of radiology. That's never true, but they consider that is because radiologists, radiology are the personnel that know what they're doing, they're the experts, okay? So anytime you can learn a piece of equipment, force somebody, buy them a cup of coffee and a donut, something to get them to show you what you need to know, uh, please do it. Because you may be called upon to actually teach a physician. They're gonna say, excuse me, um, I'm new here. Can you show me how to use this serum? I really wanna do this and this. And you wanna look, of course I can. This is easy, piece of cake, come with me. Okay. Um, and of course you need to have, now it says here you, have, you can't perform fluoroscopic procedures without having posted a current and valid technologist fluoroscopy permit. Um, not true. In a smaller facility, they post them. In larger facilities where you've got, you know, tens or hundreds of technologists working, 
that you know you can paper a wall in that so usually what they do is they post a list and the list has to include certain things and a lot of places now they go to pr what they call primary source verification they don't look at your certificate in fact <coughs> when you're working when it comes time for renewal they're going to ask you have you renewed as soon as you say yes some supervisor is going to be looking at the state site and looking for your name to pop up on the list that says yes you're approved because that will happen weeks before you get anything in the mail if you ever get anything in the mail okay. and that's what we call primary source verification joint commission accepts that state accepts that um, and of course you have to have appropriate supervision life is interesting for you folks um, does anybody have any questions? Not one? Not one single question? Okay. Uh, take a bio break for 10 minutes. By that time, uh, Mr. Siegel 